everyone. We will be. Hello, everyone. We will begin the webinar in approximately two minutes. Two minutes. Well, welcome everyone to this evening's webinar. On behalf of my partners at Understanding Ag, I want to welcome you to this evening's webinar. And also on behalf of our sister organization, the Soil Health Academy. At Understanding Ag, we work with a lot of producers who either rent land or are landowners. And we saw a real need to discuss landowner tenant relations. So this evening, we're pleased to have with us landowner Rickson Simmons and tenants Connor Pierce and Brandon Bach. So, a couple of housekeeping items. We ask that you please uh, keep your systems on mute during the presentation. We're going to hold questions until the end of the presentations. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen, and then they will be asked uh, at the end of the presentations. To get started this evening, I'd like to introduce Brandon Bach. Brandon and his wife, Jesse, farm in North Central, North Dakota. Brandon, welcome. All right, there we go. So like Gabe said, I'm Brandon Bach, a farm in North Central North Dakota with my wife and two kids. Uh, my mom and dad farm off the same farm as, as we do. And anyway, I'll start out by giving a brief um, history of kind of where we started from. So I grew up on the same farm where we currently live. Um, basically average size farm ranch. Uh, my dad lined up the first 160 acres for me to rent from a neighbor lady. So that's kind of where I started in 2003. And back then, more or less had the sole desire to make money and support my family. I guess I didn't have a family back then, but uh, within a couple of short years after that, I did. So anyway, that being said, I viewed soil as a way to generate money. You know, we grow a crop, you sell the grain, you make money. Um, I was also very fortunate back then to have neighbors that were retiring. Um, few unfortunate events happened that also led to people retiring. And anyway, long story short, I was able to rent a fair amount of farm ground. Um, we didn't spend near enough time visiting with the landowners about their long-term goals. I've come to realize that that's really important. Uh, most of our leases were one to three years in length. 
the sprayer was the most used piece of farm equipment. And my idea of improving land was moving rock piles, cleaning up old fence lines that were falling over, um, over fertilizing and spraying every weed in sight. You got to make sure that that field has zero weeds to make sure the landowner's happy. That's what my thoughts were. Anyway, um, our farming practices, though, in reality, were destroying their land. And thankfully, we started. I started to see that, which led to change. Um, and letting God onto our farm and listening to his guidance was definitely not a priority at the time. So interesting enough, after Gabe asked me to be on this webinar, I was reading this book that was copyrighted in 1924. Um, I'm going back trying to learn from the past here. Mm -hmm. Anyway, interesting enough, I ran across this uh, chapter here, and it was really interesting. So I'll just read it quickly. Renting land is often wasteful. Renting land, especially under short time leases, hastens the waste of the soil. Since the tenant does not own the land, and may not farm at another season. He is desirous of getting all out of it as he can and, and has no interest in protecting the soil. The landlord in demanding excessive rents often compels the tenant to work the soil unduly hard to pay the sum asked and make a living. Long time leases in which the tenant has an interest in the fertility of the soil, in the fertility of the soil because he will profit by the increased yields obtained and contracts under which livestock is an important part of the farm product are the best remedies for the evils of tenant farming. That just really hit home with me because it's it's so true. Anyway, things changed pretty dramatically in 2018 once I met Gabe Brown and got steered in the right direction of healing the land. So our farm went from constantly worrying about money, bankers, because that was the main priority back then. Um, we were in farm expansion mode, thought we needed maximum acres to make a living. Our water infiltration rates were very poor. I mean, a one inch rain event, we had water ponding everywhere. And I started to see these things and it just, something was wrong. Anyway, uh, we had a terrible, dry spring in the spring of 2018. We had wind erosion everywhere from even light tillage. Um, we were chemically chemical loading our land, our crops, and ourselves. We were having difficult landlord relations at times. Going back to the wind erosion in 18, I had an extremely difficult conversation with a landowner, and rightfully so. He had every right to be angry at me, and thankfully, he stuck with me and uh, we get along very well right now. Um, we had short time frame leases. We weren't spending enough time with our family and we were only viewing land as a way to make money once again. From that, we moved to taking care of God's soil first because ultimately, I truly believe we can own land, we can rent land, whatever. We're only here for a short time. The good Lord put us here to take care of the soil and we are to be stewards of that um, because somebody else is gonna have this someday and that's what really matters. So we went to virtually zero erosion with what we're doing now, uh, much better water retention, uh, less water ponding. We're learning how to be more profitable with less and by the word less, I mean less fertilizer, less chemicals, less land, less everything and uh, it's much more enjoyable. We're spending more time with the family, including working together on the farm and also vacation time. Um, now I really do look forward to the landowner meetings because it's a really good opportunity to educate, um, share what I'm seeing out in the fields, share what I'm learning. And it can be overwhelming at times for them because we got to face it. It took me 15 years to figure this thing out. We can't expect them to know everything about soil because it's not their job. I mean, it is my job and it took me that long. Um, once again, educating landlords to a better way of farming. We're getting some longer leases. Um, 
I just uh, leased another quarter of farmland from a gentleman uh, just last year. And when I when he called me asking me to rent his land, the first question I had for him was, what are your goals? And I said, I'd like to tell you mine. And he just asked me, he said, okay, well, you can start. So I just explained what I wanted to do by healing the land, taking care of it. And when I got done, he said, so what you're telling me is you'd like a 10-year lease at a fair rent rate. <laughs> And I said, absolutely. I said, that's exactly what I'd like to have. And I said, I think you and I are getting along, going, going to get along very well. Um, because he told me that if we can't be good stewards of the land, we should not own it. Mm -hmm. And I agree with him. We now have uh, much less chemical exposure, which means a safer work environment for myself, my kids, my employees. We're watching life come back to the land whether it's insects, um, we're seeing fungi in the soil, wildlife. Um, it's just so much more fun to foster life than it is death. And now, instead of viewing land as money, we're viewing it as, or as only money, I should say. Money's still an aspect of it, but we view it as a way to heal our faith, ourselves, our environment, and our communities. So I like to just kind of ask, what does our landlord want? And I'm kind of throwing myself under the bus here because the left picture here, I hope the video works, but this was actually me back in 2018 before I changed. And it makes me sick. And also the lower right picture is me seating in the spring of 18. Mm. So, but I'm very happy to say the two top pictures are me also last year. So we've gone from that to this in four years. And um, I'm very happy about that. I'm happy to say the two lower left pictures here are not me. Those are other farmers in our area. Um, this picture here on the lower left or the far left was in 2020. It was after we had 30 inches of rain in the fall of 19 and it's blew this bad in the spring of 21 after a year of prevent planning so the other pictures on the right are my fields a 16 species cover crop in the upper right that's my prevent plant if i get too wet i'll seed that in june or july and we'll add diversity and look at all the habitat for insects up there it's just incredible and there's some of our soil on the lower right and the earthworm populations are skyrocketing. So anyway, how I currently approach my uh, lease agreement meetings. I try to treat the landlord how I would want to be treated if I was on the other side of the table. Currently, I don't own a lot of land, but I would really hate to see my soil blow away and be degraded. I mean, I value it so much that I'm willing to give up a fair amount of money to see it taken care of. So that being said, I also understand that this land is not easy to come by. It's expensive. People have suffered to get it. And you have to treat them, you have to treat them as fair as you can too from a tenant side. I mean, it, money is, a, is one aspect of it. So each situation is different and must be treated as such. Not all land is created equal. Um, some of it has natural, um, better soil organic matter. Soil organic matter it just is what it is. Some of it hasn't been degraded nearly as bad. We've got some land that wasn't broke up until the 80s. It produces way better than land that was farmed in the late 1800s. So to me, that land's worth more money. It just is, because I don't have as much work to do in healing it. Um, I try to tell the land owner my goals up front, like I said on that last slide, and also ask them about theirs because their goals matter as well. We need to listen to them and see how we can work together to, to find common ground here. Once again, educate, educate, educate. We have to teach them what we're doing because most of them are not going to do the hours and hours and hours of research that we are doing as farmers, especially the farmers that want to take care of the land. They're just, they're not going to, they have busy lives the way it is. They're not going to stick the effort into it. 
Um, where else can you show value? There's all kinds of things you can do to help your landowners out, especially if they live close by. Um, maybe you can help them move some snow. Maybe you can, I don't know what it is. There's all kinds of things. You have to work that out. But there's all kinds of ways to show extra value. Pay a bonus rent. If you have a year that's above and beyond awesome and good commodity markets, pay them some extra money. That's the least you can do for them sticking with you with fair rent. Um, up front, ask for as long of a lease as you po as they're willing to do, but don't get hung up on this. If you really trust the person, I've got a lot of one-year leases year to year. Honestly, a lot of those, it's an opportunity for them to sit down and visit with me. You know, they just, they want to get together and visit and that's perfect. Let's renew the lease. Let's talk about it. There's nothing wrong with that. So don't get hung up on a one-year lease. Um, but if your goals are not in line, and in your heart, you're doing the right thing on their land. You just need to be ready to part ways. You need to say, I'm happy with what I'm currently doing and the way I'm farming. And if you want me to use up your land to generate more money, maybe that's the case. Or if they don't agree with something that you passionately agree about, you have to part ways because you will be miserable the whole time and it'll eat you up. Part ways, part ways in a very passionate matter because you never know. They may come around eventually and they won't, they may come back to you. So, um, but anyway, don't be afraid to do less and maybe find a different way to make money. Maybe you have some opportunities to make money, uh, direct marketing something. Um, there's all kinds of ways to do it. So anyway, I'd like to personally thank all of the landowners that I work with. Currently, there's 17 landowners we rent from. And I'm very thankful for every one of them because I would not be here currently today if it wasn't for them. I wouldn't have the opportunity to heal land. And I'm thankful a lot of them stuck with me um, through some pretty hard times too. So anyway, that's all I have, guys. And once again, anybody, if they want to get a hold of me, feel free. I left my phone number email address. I'm always willing to talk. Thank you, Brandon. We certainly appreciate that. All right. Well, I'm going to share screen and then I'm going to introduce Connor Pierce, Connor, whoops, Connor and his wife, Courtney. Let's see what happened here. Connor and his wife, Courtney, live in South Central Kansas. And for some reason, my screen froze up, wouldn't you know it? Okay. We'll get her going here. And it was just a delay and I started too early. <clears throat> Here's all. All right. Does that look all right there, Connor? Yep, looks good. Okay, well, welcome, Connor. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So, like you said, my name is Connor Pierce. Uh, farm with Dad in uh, Hutchinson, Kansas. Um, we grow a variety of cash crops. Um, we're starting to dabble in some adaptive grazing a little bit, um, custom grazing. We don't own any livestock ourselves. Um, but my opening slide here kind of outlines our main cash crops. We um, grow a lot of winter wheat along with sunflowers, um, our two main crops, but we also grow soybeans, corn, uh, grain sorghum, canola, um, and then I have pumpkins down there on the lower right. That's something I've started to get into a little bit the last couple of years. Um, we're experimenting with some camelina this year, um, but if you go to the next slide. Uh, my personal story is I'm a sixth generation Kansas farmer, um, studied, got my agronomy degree in, at Kansas State University, um, graduated in 2019. Um, my first kind of go at farming on my own was my sophomore year of high school, kind of like Brandon said, my dad sent, set me up with a neighbor, um, started renting a quarter. Um, so I've been renting ground on my own and renting dad's equipment, I guess. Um, since since 2014. Um, 
I started farming pretty well the way that dad did because that was the only thing I knew um which he has been no-till since the early 90s um so it wasn't like we're conventionally tilling everything but I just didn't know I didn't have knowledge that I do now um I had the opportunity to see Ray Archuleta in 2018 and that just completely took everything I knew and turned it upside down and I was able to completely change the way I view things and just being able to view things just a little bit differently was all I needed to change the way I did things, I guess. And so I didn't know everything about regenerative at the time, but just being able to view things differently immediately changed everything. And so since 2018, um, I've started using cover crops and started rotationally grazing a little bit, but keeping the soil covered and keeping a living root in the ground are two things that are of the utmost importance to me. And so it took me quite a while to figure out my context. I was trying to throw every piece of the regenerative puzzle at my ground and not quite everything was working the way I thought it should. And I finally, within the last couple of years, kind of figured out my context. And so I've able to, been able to steer the ship a little bit better that way. And so here's a picture on the right of some rolled rye in 2019, I think, when we got enough rain to actually produce some biomass. And then this on the left was a winter pea in some severely degraded soil that has, in my opinion, an incredible rhizosheath there. So just two pictures to show there. We'll go to the next slide. And so we'll talk about two farms specifically, I guess. Um, this will be my this was my first farm that I started renting in high school. Um, we started out with a simple cash rent, um, basically like anything you'd see anywhere else, just cash rent, um, go on down the road. But when I started seeing the value in regenerative, I wanted to make that connection with the landowner. Um, like Brandon said, we want to be able to rent the ground as long as we can. Um, so oh. developing that landowner relationship was important to me, even, even before I started the regenerative principles. Um, that was my goal is to get connected with the landowner. Um, started out with some severely degraded soil. Um, the guy before me conventionally tilled and it was just a wheat and milo rotate rotation or oscillation, if you will. Um, some are fallow. And so there was very, very little diversity. Um, and the ground blew, it's really light ground. And so there's a lot of wind and water erosion. Um, and so this was something that I kind of, realized right away and the, the landowner did too they have an in-ground pool on the property and after a couple first couple of years that I started farming it they're like wow we don't have soil particles in the bottom of our pool anymore we don't have to mess with that anymore and it, that just made them happy and it was just one of those simple things that really made it made a connection with the landowner um, and so obviously like I said keeping that armor on the soil is so important even especially now we're in a in a drought and having that armor on the soil really helps us out. Um, the picture on the right is a warm season cover crop mix that I had in 2021. And this was, this really made it click with the landowner because that's a Xenia there in the picture. And that was just something we threw in for a little bit more diversity um, to try to attract some beneficial insects. Um, Cause we had been struggling with some other flowering species. And so we, thought we'd try zinnias and they work actually incredibly well and so just being able to walk out the back door with a landowner and show all that diversity and just look up in the air and see all the insects and all the birds that are flying around just they didn't understand why they they got no-till right away that made sense right away but they didn't get why the cover crops what like why would you use up your moisture in between the other crops in between your cash crops and so this really made it click with them um, as far as the cover crop side of things go. And so that was one of the best days on the farm for me on that farm was they really understood what was going on after that day. And so, um, like I said earlier, I've been uh, using some pumpkins kind of as a cash crop direct marketing, um, kind of starting to figure out my context a little bit is selling direct to consumer. And so I'm starting to use pumpkins as a way to start that a little bit. And so um, that's been something I've really enjoyed and the landowners have as well. 
And so, like I said, or mentioned earlier, we've started to do a little bit of adaptive grazing, but it's been a real struggle here in the drought. And so um, just recently had a landowner uh, contact me seeking a regenerative minded tenant, which is kind of a shock to me, I guess, because I've never really heard of anything like that happening because I guess land around here is very, very competitive as far as renting goes. And so getting a call asking for me to uh, talk about a, a rent lease um, was uh, surprising to me, I guess, but obviously welcome it. And so through our uh, conversation and discussing our goals with one another, we um, decided that we'd do a cash rent on this one as well. Um, and so he was struggling with the previous tenant, I guess, communication and obviously farming practices were the priority of the landowner. And so um, he was searching for a tenant that would fit the bill, I guess. And so another unique thing, I guess I'll touch on that's starting to become more and more common is carbon credits. That's been kind of the buzzword the last couple of years. Um, and so we're as these carbon credit programs come out, there's all sorts of different things that are all sorts of different programs, I guess, as I should say. Um, and so we decided to factor that into our <coughs> rental agreement um, kind of as a benefit to the landowner, because obviously I'm cash renting and uh, cover crop costs, the risk, um, everything going regenerative is basically on me, even though it allows or it aligns with both of our goals. Um, the carbon credit side of things, I guess, um, to me, was a benefit to the landowner through our lease. And so I'm pretty excited to implement that. And um, I believe, in my opinion, that these kind of things will become more common um, because landowners are becoming more and more, I guess, educated on where they're, what their tenants are doing um, and how they're producing the food. And I guess that goes for the public in general, everyone is becoming more and more educated on where their food comes from. And so there's going to be more and more landowners that are looking for tenants to uh, farm regeneratively, in my opinion. Next slide. I think that's all I have for you guys. Uh, happy to answer questions at the end. Um, and my email is listed there. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. That's a real testament when you have landowners reach out to you. Congratulations, you don't, you don't hear that too often. So good job. Next, I'd like to introduce Rickson Simmons. Rickson is from Jackson, Mississippi, and he's gonna give us a bit of background as a landowner. Okay, Welcome, thank Rickson. you. Thank you, Gabe. Yeah, um, just a lot of different, different, I guess, scenario here. We're in Mississippi. My mom was from Southwest Kansas, and that land is, uh, well, now it's in the third generation, fixing to move over to the fourth. That ground's been farmed on shares. My grandfather was in the uh, grain business, and he acquired the land over time. Uh, he never actually farmed the ground. He ran the grain elevators and bought land over the years. Um, the, the two tenants that farm that ground, interesting, uh, no written leases, which is seems strange, but it doesn't to us. One family's been on that ground farming since the mid fifties. Uh, the other tenant has been uh, on that ground. They actually live adjacent to the ground and they have farmed that ground since uh, 1969. Uh, so it's been a great relationship. Um, we, that's the only thing we've ever known uh, for me here in Mississippi. Um, I met, um, went to Chico in 2018. That's when I met Abe and uh, Alan. And that was December of 2018. We came back in 2019 in January uh, Gabe was in Deerfield, which is just north of the farm, and both the tenants uh, attended that. And from there, they were excited in the soil health and went to Soil Health U uh, in Salina, 
2019, and that's when we kind of started the journey. Uh, we've had six tenths of an inch of rainfall since July. So it's a really difficult environment from my perspective. It's difficult when you've been an absentee landowner. Um, we've gotten income off that farm. We've split the, the bills, uh, you know, by shares. Uh, our responsibility has been to take care of irrigated land. Anything below ground has been our responsibility, wells, uh, uh, underground piping, that sort of thing, above ground sprinklers, um, pumps or, or engines for pumps, their responsibility. We've split fertilizer builds, uh, the they take care of. Y'all may be familiar with all this. I don't know. Some folks aren't. Um, and it's, it's been a good relationship for us. I just feel like whatever benefited him benefited me. And I saw this soil health. I said, wow, uh, with the diminishing water, we did, we were in, we're in the Ogallala Aquifer, were, and we depleted that about 12 years ago. Had to go deeper and we're pulling water from very deep in the ground. It's very expensive. And the climate is getting drier. And if we're gonna to continue to farm out there on the dry ground, as well as the irrigated, in my perspective, we cannot continue to do things the way we have and expect the same. It just, it just won't work. So uh, it's, it's, I've been pleased with the progress we've made uh, what I've liked getting further along, absolutely. But with the with the diminished amount of rain, it's just been, from my perspective, it's difficult. So, uh, you know, how do you, <laughs> we've not been involved for all these years. How do I all of a sudden come in and say, okay, can we do this? Can we do that? Um, so I, I think it's been a great relationship up to now. We hope to continue that, obviously. I've been very pleased. Um, it's interesting, some of, the, some of the things that they've noticed in the past year have actually been from, uh, I'm not gonna say mistakes, but they've been, they've been surprises that, that something happened they weren't expecting and then they, you know, the, then the question is, well, can we duplicate this again? So, uh, as you say all the time, Gabe, you know, uh, you want to make small changes, change the way you do things, you want to make big changes, change the way you see things. And I think that's what we're beginning to do is make those changes to look at things different. So, uh, uh, I guess I'm more for, questions and answers. <laughs> uh, That's very good, Rex, and thank you. I'll start asking you a question. How has it been now the acceptance? You approached your tenants about soil health. They attended soil health. You are <clears throat> you having more conversations with them about soil health? And what is what has their response been to that? Yes, yes. Um, and I, as a landowner, when we've been we've been distant for so long, and they've done everything, and it's just been maybe it's a terrible term of mailbox money for us. We're not living on the land. We know they take care of it. Uh, we've, I mean, they've, they've we've had that relationship so long for me to get involved and start trying to make changes to soil health. There's, in my perspective, there's a fine line between helping and telling someone what to do. This may be our ground, but they are the one that's, that's benefiting the most it, and they make those day-to-day -day decisions especially with those, maybe this excuse, I don't think so, especially in this dry, brittle environment when the wind's blowing, 
it's hot, it's dry. It is a difficult place, difficult. And um, so would I, would I like to be further along? Yeah, we'd all say that. I'm pleased with where we, where we have been. Uh, as Verl said this morning, he said, you know, we're, we're, um, we're making, uh, we're still in the learning progress and we're making slow changes. I, I thought that was a good way to put it. So we're seeing things happen. Uh, I think they realize that, that we're gonna have to make changes going forward, uh, continue to make changes going forward. I think they have up to this point. And uh, I mean, I've been pleased. Uh, great, great. Rickson, now I can't pass up this opportunity though. Please share with the audience here a bit on your grazing operation in Mississippi. Well, yeah, I almost forgot that. how that's progressed. Yeah, I almost <laughs> forgot that. Yes, okay. So, you know, after meeting you guys, <laughs> I hadn't slept good since 2018. My wife can attest to that. <laughs> I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm listening to YouTube videos just like you guys do. <laughs> it's like you've messed up my sleep pattern. So um, we leased up. I, I'm 70 years old. Uh, we had a small contracting business that we sold, uh, I guess it's been five years ago. We sold that business and then uh, I was helping someone who was a customer of mine that had cattle on, on a piece of ground and they were doing regenerative grazing. So I said, well, let me just come out here and move the cows. I'd never been around cows in my life. I'm a city guy. So went out there and helped them move those cows uh, just free, just, just to be around the animals and learn. Well, they, they left that place and gave up that lease. And I leased the ground that uh, three years ago, my, my oldest son, uh, we leased the ground and um, we uh, we contract grazed for two years and now we've owned some cattle and uh, you know so I'm on, I'm on both sides of the fence uh, trying to show this landowner that they've never had anybody really take care of the ground like we are and I keep them up to date what we're doing while we're doing it you know they they would like a more manicured cured farm. It's, it's actually in the city limits of a, of a suburb of Jackson. And um, so trying to explain to them how we don't want to keep everything clipped. But we're going to clip with cow power, not horsepower, not, not tractors. So they begin to see the changes. Uh, uh, we're going to uh, process some of these animals later this summer, and they're excited about that. They were in the restaurant business years ago. Uh, and that's, so they understand food. And <laughs> it was interesting. I was checking the bricks one day and uh, <laughs> had my instrument out checking the bricks. And the owner says, well, what are you doing with that? And I'm explaining the sugar solids. That's how they used to check their soft drink machines. They measured the sugar solids from the, um, drinks from the fountain drinks i thought that was that was interesting yeah so yep. uh so yeah so it's been, it's been fun and i've learned a lot you know and i'm I, so i'm on the learning end and and it's just been interesting yeah rickson now you you didn't know i was going to do this but alan has been bragging about you and the the work that you've been doing. So I'm gonna call on Alan right now to talk to the group a bit about <laughs> the changes that he's noticed on your grazing operation. Uh, Alan? You bet, thanks Gabe. And uh, so Rick's and, Rick's and you and your son have uh, really done a fantastic job. I mean, I, I don't know, you've been to what, three soil health academies now, is that right? Or Yeah, that's probably right, yep. yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I mean, Rickson almost became a regular. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I still remember stepping foot on the place for the first time 
you know, before y'all had taken over really. And, uh, and it had been conventionally grazed, a so set stock grazed, all of that. And, and we were going around and looking at everything. And I remember one of the things we did was we measured soil temperature uh, mm -hmm. and just three paces away, you know, we measured it where they had, the, the, the previous cattle had grazed down tight and, uh, and then three paces nice. away where they had left a tuft of grass and there was more than a 30 degree difference, mm -hmm. you know, between those areas. And, and I still remember your reaction to that. Yeah. And, uh, that, that just really resonated. And so, you know, Rickson really spent a lot of time both at the academies and on his own learning the basics of adaptive grazing. And then they just dove right in. And I, I can honestly tell you that the changes on the place have been remarkable. Uh, and, and it's been, you know, a whole host of changes. So again, that good old rule of compounding, but mm. what I what I see, Rick, and you know, you, you've, you've absolutely increased plant species diversity. Uh, you've increased biomass production. You've increased the bricks. You've increased total days of, uh, of what I would call good grazing per year. So you've extended the grazing season. And y'all have really gained a good grasp of, you know, how to observe, move those animals around, use them as a tool uh, for soil building and, and ecosystem building while also, you know, putting gain on animals and, and that type of thing. So, uh, so I really want to commend you. And it, it's been a lot of fun watching your growth and the growth of the piece of ground that you're working on. <laughs> I've got to laugh because <laughs> when, when you show pictures in the pictures, <laughs> when you take pictures of cow pats and you're excited about dung beetles, <laughs> That's a long ways. <laughs> yeah, well, hats off to you, Rexon. <laughs> next, oh, before, yep, next, before we get started on question and answers, I wanted Shane to discuss the, something that he has noticed as of late when, when we're talking about opportunities for those who farm regeneratively. Shane? Thank you, Gabe. So, yeah, you know, we speak to a lot of clientele, and it's amazing to me the amount of landowners that are inquiring, looking for tenants to start implementation of regenerative practices. And I know I've consulted on numerous ones of those and trying to work with, you know, their present uh, renters. And, and it's amazing to me that you have the landowners trying to provide the education to the, the tenant encouraging them to implement good soil health practices. And, you know, really there's a lot of resistance out there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, you kind of get stuck in the middle as being a consultant or someone working with the land ownership. And it really comes down to, you know, uh, they both have to kind of put a little bit of skin in the game. Obviously the tenant may have to, you know, provide the equipment to do the seeding of possibly a cover crop or maybe look at, changing some of their equipment, utilizing more no-till, or, you know, there's a lot of negotiations that have to occur between the tenant and and the landowner. And, I, you know, I really appreciate Brandon, and I know Connor, and, you know, Rick's, and obviously, you know, I know you guys have sat down and negotiated out how this needs to look, and it's not an easy conversation, but, you know, I think when both both sides are trying to reach the same goal or objective, you know, things can get figured out. And I will share with you with Ricks. And I, I think the first time I ever did a, a, a consult like that was with Ricks and with his, his tenants. And it was, it was kind of a difficult day that day. It wasn't Ricks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but, yeah. but I think that they're capturing and they're really trying. And, and the problem with it is that is a brittle environment. Mm -hmm. And that's where you got to become more intentional about understanding these principles. And, you know, like Connor down there and, you know, South Central Kansas, that is a tough, windy environment. That is just, and like Connor, I mean, he illustrated it numerous times, armor, armor, armor on that soil, get her covered. And, you know, but he's right. We got to grow the biomass first in order to get the armor. So, 
I, thanks for letting me share that, Gabe. But, you know, we see that quite frequently. You bet. Thanks, Shane. So the first question we have is for Connor. Connor, the uh, listener, wants to know, has your dad seen the changes and what does he think of them? So <laughs> I guess early on, we were, he, he saw Ray Archuleta at the same time I did. So I guess um, we both had the same opportunity there. And so kind of both opened both of our minds a little bit. It wasn't me just bringing these thoughts and practices home to the farm. Um, he did let me try on my own before uh, he did too much, but um, we are implementing cover crops on his operation as well. Um, I would say he he's still figuring out his context a little bit. We're still trying to identify goals um, with those cover crops and implementing implementing grazing as well. So when we can. Great. Good to hear. OK, the next uh, listener asks. I'm a landowner that is very interested in the land. It has been in the family for nearly 50 years. We have a flex rent program with a base amount to be paid per acre. And if the crop is good and prices have been good, then a bonus is paid. We participate in a carbon program, which I complete the data for and input each year. Data is provided by the tenant. I, the landowner, provide about 25% of the cost of the cover crop. We require no-till and we require cover crops each year. We plan on going to a three-year three rotation with small grain so that we can move the needle more with a cover crop after the small grain crop. We had been in a corn and soybean rotation. Right now, the agreement is for three years Oh, I missed that here. The agreement is for three years. I'd like to see more push for regenerative farming from his end and not just coming from me. Am I as a landowner being too controlling by asking for these practices on my farm? Rickson, I'll start with you. Oh, uh, I mean... <laughs> I guess that's that's where I am. The same type thing is how you know. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know where the line is. Mm -hmm. um, you guys are the same way. We we're all after the. It's like two dogs fighting for one bowl of food. We're all after the same thing. It's how do we get there. Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. Okay. Brandon, care to chime in? Okay. So I'm going to assume a couple of things here, and I know one should never assume, but since she's talking about a corn soybean rotation, I'm assuming he's dealing with extremely degraded soils from a hundred plus years ago, and he's probably dealing with fairly high rents. That being said, this tenant has a lot of work to do to heal that land to get it to the point to where it's profitable on less. So you just really need to think about how much money you may have to give up as a landowner to heal this land and get that tenant steered in the right direction. Now, I'm not saying that these rents aren't attainable down the road. You know, maybe maybe it's going to take 10 years. Maybe it takes 15. And maybe you can get these rents back up where you're at right now, but you might have to give more than you think to heal this land that's so degraded. Now, like I say, that's assuming certain things. Um, that it's a really loaded question and what he's dealing with, but he's going to have to be really open with discussion to that tenant, and they're going to have to come to an understanding of what it takes to get, you know, to progress this regenerative model. Yep. It doesn't happen overnight. And there, there can certainly be some pain along the way. I mean, just because you're going to grow cover crops doesn't mean you're going to be more profitable the next year. You might have, you might have drought, and then that cover crop is going to give you less of a crop next year. And if you're going to keep your rents where they were to start with, it's not going to work for the tenant. And I can see where he might have some resistance to that if he's used to farming in the old production model, high input. There's just a lot of angles to that question. And that's where you just have to sit down. 
you have to find common ground that works for both parties. Good point, Brandon. Connor, anything you want to add to that? Absolutely. I think Brandon answered it pretty well. Um, it does say earlier in the question that obviously the tenant is, or the landowner is giving a share for the cost of the cover crop. Um, so it is showing effort, I guess, by the landowner. Um, and I guess I would just say it comes down to comes down to your goals and and the tenant's goals. Um, and like Brandon said, just a conversation that you got to have between the two of you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to add, Connor, if you're, if you're finished. Are you finished, Connor? Yes. Yep. We, we have split the cost. That's one of the first questions I got. Uh, one of the tenants after hearing Dave, that was in January, he came back, ordered seed, cover crop seed, winter mix, and we planted that seed. He planted that seed in January of that, of that year. And he asked me early on, are you willing to split the cost of the cover crop seed? And my answer was absolutely. I mean, that wasn't even a question to me. And we've done that ever since. Uh, He's brought uh, animals on the ground. Now that raises another question is going forward, we're trying to figure out, okay, some of the ground may go back to perennial. Well, we have, we've taken one quarter and may put two quarters back into perennial pastures because the land is so degraded. It's an irrigated land. And we just don't have the water to support it anymore. And uh, so how do we do those splits? But realizing that if, if we're going to get get it back to where it was. We're gonna to have to make some major shift and been willing to do that. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, if it works for one, it works for all. If it works for none, it doesn't work at all. So. Mm -hmm. Good, good point. Good points there. Okay, next question is, is there a standard procedure that can be shared for measuring water infiltration? How often should this be done to compare progress or lack thereof? Shane, I'm gonna call on you to respond and explain water infiltration test. So obviously you can use an infiltration ring, excuse me, to do water infiltration testing. Probably one test I would really start encouraging is the, the aggregate stability test and look at our micro and macro aggregation. Not really call that the report card, you know, maybe of how good a job did we do with the implementation of the principles and using the rules to manage those principles. And how good a job did we do about building an, an aggregate? Because um, obviously we need the aggregate in order for water to infiltrate, but that six inch water infiltration ring is a good device to use. It's simple to drive it in the soil three inches, take a 440 mils of water and pour it in there and time and see how long it takes. Yep. And we have six numerous. Inch yeah, six inch diameter ring, six inches tall, drive it in halfway. Yep. And I interrupt again. When I came back from soil health, the first time, uh, well, this is before they were, this was before they were exposed to it. Uh, uh, took a water infiltration ring, because, and we went out to the middle of the field and oh, we're gonna have good water infiltration. We drove that ring into the ground and we finally left it. And we went to find, uh, they don't have fence roads out there, but I did find a telephone pole with the guy wire. We went to that, telephone pole and we cleaned off a little debris from on top of the ground and we drove that ring in and the water went straight in the ground. And I said, okay, now that's what we're trying to improve because no matter how much water we're putting on, it doesn't matter if it's not going in the ground. And that just I never left me. I was I was shocked as were they. So uh, that was kind of interesting when we, I guess that started just on the process. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent test and, and it really uh, opens some eyes. Next question is from Hunter. Hunter says, most of the land in our area is row crop. Being a cattle producer, how do you bring the idea 
of converting the land to pasture. Who would like to start that one? <laughs> Alan? I guess I, I guess I guess I can okay, got maybe touch touch on that just a little bit. Um I guess we don't own any livestock ourselves and we're all always looking to I guess rotationally graze on some cover crops from time to time. Um, I guess some producers are in our area or uh, they have their own grazing that they can take care of themselves. And so sometimes it's a little bit difficult to find cows to graze with or people that are willing to do the rotational grazing instead of just turning them loose on a quarter um, and letting them go go for it. Um, so I guess I think there's a lot of opportunity if there are people in your area that are utilizing cover crops to uh, graze that and maybe not necessarily converting it all the way to pasture. I would second that. Why would you want to turn decent farm ground into pasture ground when you can incorporate cover crops, interseed them? You can have the best of both worlds at the end of the day. It just has to be done properly. Alan, would you care to add anything? Yeah, if, it, if it's ground that's typically been row cropped and and priced accordingly, then it would be difficult to to make that land pay for itself, you know, by converting to, say, a year round cow calf operation or something like that. So I, I agree with Connor and Brandon in that, uh, you know, the best way to approach that is a win win for both, you know, a farmer and, and a grazer and you you plant cover crops and you graze those cover crops and that allows you know the grazer to be able to uh, provide fertility and biological stimulation to the subsequent cash crops so uh, and then you also look at uh, broader crop rotations that facilitate both as well so mm -hmm. and don't limit it to cap you know uh, there, there's many other livestock options as well that you can utilize there you can you can graze multiple species of livestock. You can look at sheep rather than cattle. You can look at multiple classes of cattle and you can combine multiple species, you know, on, onto that same cover crop ground. I'll, I'll just add to that, if I may, a program that we ran here in Burley County, North Dakota for a while was we helped to facilitate uh, lining up straight cash grain farmers with livestock producers and the way we we did that was to help them with an agreement whereas the livestock owner would pay for the cover crop seed the land owner obviously had the land and the equipment to seed it and then the grazing the amount that was grazed was determined mutually between the two of them, but there had to be enough residue left to satisfy the, you know, all things considered, you know, taking into account weather, et cetera, to satisfy the, the needs of the landowner for how much residue they wanted the following year, depending on, on the uh, uh, subsequent crop. And that was a really good way to introduce animals onto cropland that previously had not been grazed. And uh, the soil district facilitated that for a number of years and many of those relationships still exist. So there, there's ways to do it that are beneficial to both. Next question asks, Gabe, What's the demand for SHA classes? Are a lot of people turned away? Are landowners as well as renters seeking to take them? Is there a lot of need for scholarships? I'd, I love what you are doing at SHAs. Well, thank you. Uh, obviously, the, the demand for courses has been very well. They, they tend to sell out. And, and are full, which is good. Uh, if you're wanting to donate money for scholarships, that would be greatly appreciated. We, the SHA Board of Directors has done a good job in securing some funding for scholarships for uh, various groups of people. And 
we encourage you to go on the Soil Health Academy website and learn more. We try and hold as many as we can during the summer months, and they're always held uh, in conjunction or near a farm or ranch that is using regenerative practices. And we do a lot of on-site, hands-on learning out in the field. So we encourage you to, to seek that out and please attend. You know, you can become a regular like Rickson was. And, you know, Brandon <laughs> talked about the first one he attended. And next one, this attendee asked, what is some advice for renters that are working with landowners that are very conventionally minded to invest or allow the renter to invest in infrastructure for integrating livestock on crop and grasslands, et cetera? It's things such as perimeter fences and water de development. And if the renter is investing, what is it fair to expect out of the owner as far as long-term rent contracts and rental rates. Uh, any of the panelists wanna address that? I'll take that one, because that's been okay. what we've done at the farm here in Mississippi. Three-year lease, uh, exterior fence was not the best, but adequate. Um, as long as we can keep grass in front of the cows, they don't, they don't tend to wanna go across the other side of the fence. The monies we've spent have been on, uh, first thing we did was went around all the ponds, put a fence up around all the ponds with uh, solar uh, solar chargers. Uh, keep the cows out of the ponds. We built two portable water, uh, water pumps with little 150 gallon tanks on them that we haul around. Uh, now we've gotten smart and we actually put some totes on uh, top of pond dams and we gravity feed where well, we pump up to the tank, gravity feed out of the tank. At one location, we're crossing a creek and going 1,200 feet in an inch and a half water line. And that field uh, had very little grazing done on it before we got there. Now we've accessed the whole place. Every pasture we go to now has water. Uh, we've put there was limited electric fence on the interior. And now every one of our pastures, about 250 acres, uh, most of them are anywhere from 15 to 25 acre pastures. And we've got hot wire to every one of them so that I can quickly and easily cross fence. You know, I'm, I'm, I enjoy it. It's fun for me. I'm trying to make this so that if I'm not in the picture, my son uh, can come out here while still working another job and be able to quickly move the animals with hot fence. Uh, I've put in all that. The, the contract that I have with my folks here in Mississippi is all that watering, all the internal fences are mine. They're all portable and they can go with me if I leave, which used to go somewhere else. Uh, we've invested a lot of, a lot of time, um, a lot of fiberglass posts, stuff that we can take with us. A lot of it we can take with us. Some of it we would not, but it's, it's allowed us the opportunity to be able to move cows on a daily basis without much. And I have bore that expense. They still, uh, any supplies on a perimeter fence, their contract says that they, they supply it. Now we hadn't had to do that up to this point. We've just taken care of it because it's mm -hmm. that's the way we do that. Any other comments on that? Uh, if not, I, I will add something there. So uh, we lease approximately 3,000 acres of perennial grazing land uh, from six different landowners. And I, when I secure those leases, what I tell them is I will put brand new perimeter fence. It's going to be high tensile electric, which is theirs. At the end of the five-year lease, that, that's their fence. I also develop water. You know, we don't, here in North Dakota, we, you got to go up to Brandon's to find surface water. You don't find surface water in South Central North Dakota. So we have developed shallow high-density polyethylene pipelines. Uh, we've put in 
oh, approximately 15 miles of that water development with, oh, pretty over 50 watering sites. But the tanks are mine. The water pipe itself is theirs. But here's the kicker. All the wells are on my own land. So if somebody comes and tries leasing it away, they don't have any water because the wells are on my land. The interior fences are, there is a few major single strand high tensile fences in order for us to get electricity, but then all the fencing is temporary poly wire. So if we were to lose a lease, it, the tanks are rubber tire tanks that can be picked up with a loader tractor and moved and the interior fences can all be taken down they get the exterior fence. I pay slightly below going rental rates, approximately 10 to 15% lower, and they have to give me a five-year lease. In saying that, every landowner uh, that we lease from, we've been leasing from for anywhere from 15 to 30 years. So uh, not quite as long as Rickson has, but we're working on it. So. It's worked out very well, and the landowners appear to be extremely pleased. They haven't booted us out yet. So, next question is from Kevin. Kevin writes All of our farm ground is currently in a winter wheat fallow rotation. We do graze our stubble after harvest when working to introduce cover crops and graze them. How would you approach the landlord about the rent in a typical fallow year that would not be grazed? Brandon, I think you should talk a little bit about fallow. <laughs> oh, you don't want to talk to me about fallow. Yeah, I do. I want no. that to hear. <laughs> well, I mean, we used to have summer fallow up here too. I mean, I grew up cultivating summer fallow. That was my first time driving tractor. So I know all about it. Everything about it is awful. So I would highly encourage, yeah, you, you need to you need to start growing more plants, period. I mean, you need more living roots, you need overwintering roots. And I don't obviously you're getting by without paying rent currently on the fallow year. Pay some rent on for grazing your cows on it the next year. I mean, you just you'd be amazed what you can grow once you add diversity out there. Like I've tried to dry ground out and I know it can happen in certain years, it, it does happen, but there's a lot of years where it just amazes me. We can have massive biomass growing on the field and, and there's still moisture there. It's incredible. Once you shade that ground and get living roots, it's phenomenal how much more you can grow once you shade that ground and eliminate that fallow ground. So. My advice would be quit the summer follow, start raising overwintering cover crops with big diversity, switch up your crop rotation, maybe throw some field peas in there, get an earlier cover crop, and don't look in the rearview mirror and move forward. Pay some rent for the grazing of the cattle, yeah. and you will be so much further ahead. Yeah, there's a lot of research out there that shows that long-term uh, growing cover, adding cover crops in the fallow year increases profitability and profit profitability and actually increases water holding capacity of course and the moisture for that crop year uh, that's that just uh, needs to be done that's the first thing that that needs to be addressed next question is from Josh and Josh Josh asks are most of your long term leases the same flat rate for each year of the lease, or is there an annual percentage increase? Very good question. Connor, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, oh, you're on mute, Connor. Sorry about that. Um, so for my two farms that I talked about, they are both five-year leases and they both are the flat rate for the duration of the lease. And then it obviously increases after each lease so yeah brandon um mine are all flat rent leases but there again 
you need to be willing to pay a bonus when you i mean here's the deal they're based off a given commodity price given yields given conditions and you got to be willing to pay a bonus otherwise they will find somebody else if they don't feel like they're being treated fairly so just because it's a flat rent really doesn't mean anything to me um that's just a starting point so yeah. rick send did you have anything to add there well uh <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking through my brain because we we talked a little bit about this uh with the with my tenants of uh you know, I, we split, um, if we get any government subsidies, they're split by the same chair. And I don't know how, you know, I guess I'm just not familiar with with set leases. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we. Okay. And Pamela has to point out that I used the F word, you know, she didn't think she would ever hear Gabe <laughs> Brown using the word fallow. I'd like to put a few uh f's other f's with fallow but but thank you pamela for pointing that out that that's a good one uh any last comments from the panelists well i want to surely on behalf of understanding ag soil health academy i want to thank our three panelists this evening for a very insightful uh webinar on a very important topic we ask you all to check out our Understanding Ag and Soil Health Academy websites. And we encourage you to attend Soil Health Academies and take a look at our resource page and everything we have going on there. Uh, we've, thanks to a grant from Wells Fargo, we were able to develop a number of case studies and Brandon Box Farm was highlighted in one of those case studies. So we encourage you to, to check that out. Thank you for attending, everybody. We'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks, panelists. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Gabe. All right.